Okay. Um, okay. Uh, if you guys could type your first name in so I don't have to read the silly handles, although I don't mind, um, that would be great. So uh, <laughs> this question is from Handy the Sock. Hi, Andrew. Question, I create intellectual uh, character properties. Okay. So maybe he's like creating little cute characters that he's drawing and things. Let's assume that's what he's talking about. Um, what do you suggest is the best way to get them out and possibly sold? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're if you're really into creating characters, um, sometimes people. This is I have very specific advice on this because we've had a lot of students in this area. The product needs to stand up on its own is the best way I'm going to put it. So if you if if you do your cute character or disgusting character, or funny character, edgy character, or character that's making a statement, whatever character you're creating, handy the sock, that's your handle. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's pretty, that's a pretty appropriate handle for somebody that does characters, handy the sock. Um, that if you're doing those types of things, you have to ask yourself, you know, not everybody has the benefit of a TV show. You know, you see, um, my eight-year-old daughter's right really into the Disney series Descendants right now. And, of course, she had a birthday recently. And, of course, the balloons and her outfit and everything was Descendants, right? And so when you create a character on your own, you don't have any of that benefit, right? There's no TV show. There's no book. There's no nothing. So you have to ask yourself up front the question, if you want to license a character, does it stand up on its own? If it's on a T-shirt or a coffee mug or or if it's an actual plush stuffed animal or something like that, would it stand up on its own? You know, and so like I remember there was this uh, product called the Ugly Dolls, and you know if people just look at them and you get a reaction, whether they think it's pretty or beautiful or funny or edgy or gross or cute or whatever it is, if the product would sell without the TV show, without the book, then you can license it just like anything else. But if it's really confusing to people, it's not emotionally appealing to them. Um, it's there's there's if there's any point of confusion there, then that's a problem, you know. So I think you have to take a look at what um, your characters. What would they make sense as plush characters? Would they make sense on T-shirts? Would they make sense? It, it, what's the product that you would sell? And I think any company you send to is going to look at it. Oh, God, so cute. We could just make T-shirts and sell that tomorrow. Or we could make coffee mugs or we could make um, stuffed animals. Or maybe your characters are also wrapped into some sort of invention, too, sometimes. It's probably not the case for you, but occasionally I see that. Um, so, but when people are up in their own head about their characters that they've created, that they want to license and they got all this backstory and all this, you know, interesting stuff, but you don't have a TV show to relay all that. So how do you relay that with the product you're going to license? You know, I mean, maybe it's a plush character and the way you do the packaging and then the back of the it tells a little story and that's enough. Maybe it is. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes when people have very complicated backstories, oh, but my character is this, this, and the marketing isn't clear. But you can usually make the marketing clear to make the product sell on its own. But you're not going to have the benefit of a TV show or a movie or a book. So just keep that in mind. So that's my best advice. Um, ask yourself, does it stand up on its own? And if it doesn't, what do you need to do to make it stand up on its own? You know? Um, so that was uh, from Handy the Sock. And if you guys can make sure to type your first name so I don't have to read the handles, although it is kind of fun to read the handle, Handy the Sock. Um, uh, J Fireball 13 uh, what are the best DRTV companies? Um, well, you know, Stephen and I have said this publicly, and I don't mind saying this. Uh, DRTV is... Um, it's not like other industries. So DRTV, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's infomercials or direct response television is what, and they used to call it infomercials. Um, and DRTV doesn't have the greatest reputation. I mean, in a lot of ways, um, if it looks cheesy and get rich quick, it kind of is quite often, you know? And so the products, uh, however, I have to say that 
the infomercial business has really stepped up their game over the years. So in the old days, like you'd order on the 800 number and the product would be not performing well. And then they would make you jump through all sorts of hoops. This is back in the day um, to call the 800 or try to get your money back. And there was lots of, you know, extra shipping charges you, you weren't clear on, things like that. So they, they had a terrible reputation back in the day, but that's really changed a lot. DRTV companies these days, they create awareness with their infomercials and their ads, but most people are like going down the aisle at Walmart or Target, like, oh yeah, I saw the infomercial. I know what that is. I saw the infomercial of that. They drop it in the car and go, well, if it sucks, I'll just return it. You know, and so, and so they brought it up a level to where the products are good enough that, because they don't want, you know, Walmart's not going to keep carrying it if half the people are returning it because it's shoddy quality that looks bad on Walmart or Target or whoever. So they've took, taken up, they've done a lot better job of taking it up a notch with the quality level on most products. And most products for a lot of DRTV companies, 95% of their product is sold at retail. And they're not sold in the 800 number. Now, a lot of those companies are now going online. They're doing a lot of online sales as well, Facebook ads, things like that. So that's changing quite a bit there as well. But um, so, yeah, sometimes the infomercials are a little cheesy. They're actually a great model for how to do a video if you want to do a video. But you don't have to add the cheesiness to it that they do sometimes, just the format. Like there's a problem and then there's a solution, right? Maybe it's black and white and then it turns to color. And then, oh, we got the solution. That's just one of many techniques you can use. But actually looking at, at infomercials is a good way to, to, to figure out how to do for a good percentage of non-infomercial products. Um, use that same format. doesn't have to be cheesy, though. You don't have to do the same cheese factors they do sometimes with somebody yelling at you or whatever. You don't want to make a, you know, a standard non-DRTV product look like a DRTV product. But the format is great for the videos. So... Uh, but the people that are in DRTV, the companies themselves, and a lot of the inventors, everybody wants to make a million dollars overnight, which you can make a lot of money overnight with DRTV, which is not true with regular licensing. But there's a get rich quick vibe to it that, you know, doesn't really sit perfectly well with me. And uh, there's, there's questionable DRTV companies out there. So I can't make any statements or anything like that. But, you know, if you're if you're in DRTV, we've had many guests on that are DRTV experts. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're swimming with the sharks. You have to accept that. Now, we haven't had one of our students get knocked off in 20 years of students in 65 countries by a DRTV or a non-DRTV company that I'm aware of. But if it's going to happen, it's going to happen more likely in DRTV. So if you're going to be in DRTV, you need to be willing to assume a little bit more risk. It's kind of what I call a treasure chest project. You know, they license very few of the products that they see, but if it goes out and then the initial test does well and another test does well, then they just run the heck out of it. And that's when you can make a lot of money faster than with other products. But I think, you know, um, if you have, if you're skittish about being, if you're the paranoid inventor, don't do DRTV. It'll just cater to all your paranoia. Do the other categories that are more warm and fuzzy and you're not getting weird vibes and all that sort of thing, which you will get from DRTV. Um, so, you know, we've had All Star uh, Marketing, a DRTV company, on come on many times. I, I think they're pretty good guys. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I like them, but I'm not endorsing them or anything like that, but I think they're a good, a good company. We haven't had any of our students have problems with them. I've talked to inventors that have had problems with other DRTV companies. I've seen some pretty crazy stories. So if you're going to be on DRTV, you have to be willing to assume that risk. And people in DRTV are telling us that too. So it's real. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't see inventors getting ripped off left and right all the time. I just don't. Um, so if if you if you do DRTV, you know, I would do, and I only recommend this, Stephen. I only recommend this with DRTV. You do one at a time. They get weird if they know you showed it to somebody else. So you, you show it to your favorite first, and then another. And I would never do this with any other product category. I would just blast it out to everybody. If you got 30 companies that are doing kitchen gadgets, you get it to all of them. One at a time, you want to shoot yourself in the head, but there aren't that many DRTV companies. There are only like really five or six major DRTV companies. So um, there aren't that many to show to. There are other ones that are kind of feeder companies and they'll, 
take it and then do a little testing. And then if it goes well, they'll resell it to one of the big guys because it's insane amount of money to do a DRTV business. You need to have a lot of cash to do that. So there aren't that many companies that do it. Um, let's see. Dexter says, hey, I want to approach a company for licensing a packaging idea. I'm afraid they reject me and use my idea. There is no PPA here. And from I gather, NDAs aren't strong enough advice. Well, Dexter, my question is, why is there no PPA? So I, we always advise our students to file a PPA for any product that they work on. And if you're working on a packaging product, so we're talking about, it's going to make it sound terrible, but uh, DRTV is tough and packaging is brutal, guys. I mean, they will try to figure out a way around you because there's so much money involved in packaging. And that's not the case for other categories. I would not say that's true. But you're not going to license straight up, Dexter. You will not license a package product. I'll look right at the camera and say it. You will not license a packaging product if it's not patentable. That's not true of a lot of other categories. Kitchen, gardening, automotive products, all sorts of other categories, pet. Sometimes they're not, it's not patentable or it's weak and you can do it just fine. But as a packaging product, like a new toothpaste tube or the package that the other products go in, um, you have to have a PPA. You have to file that. So my answer is file a PPA. Also, Think about your own sanity. Packaging products are very, very difficult. You have to have a higher level of sophistication to do them. So if you have a dog toy or a kitchen gadget or something else like that, I wouldn't make a packaging product your first product. Um, and if you, But if you do, I would always file a PPA. And so I'm not saying don't work on packaging products. I just say, you know, nice to get your feet wet with another product and then get some familiarity with licensing and then working on a packaging product because it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder, a lot harder. You got to figure out manufacturing where you don't with a lot of other products. And then you got to figure out um, patenting around the manufacturing and you don't need to do that with a lot of products. So we just talked about two difficult industries, DRTV. And um, I don't think DRTV is difficult. You come up with some fun idea and you look at it, but it's just a little sharky. Um, and, and packaging, you need to have a lockdown understanding of manufacturing and the provisional patent at the very least um, to get going with that. And that's not true of their categories. So when you hear me say things sometimes, don't go, oh, that's always true in all situations because that's not the case. But a lot of the stuff that we teach is definitely applies. Um, the 10 steps applies for most products in most categories most of the time. But there's always exceptions. Uh, Keaton said, Hey, Andrew, I have a question. Will a company ask for a patent? If so, what to do? Get on the phone. So when you get interest early on from a company, sometimes they'll email you, uh, send us your patent, send us your prototype. And the inventor will jump through their butt to get those things to them. And it's the stupidest thing you could do. Not because you don't, don't want them to see your, your provisional patent, your patent, not because you don't want them to see your prototype because they're not sales tools. They don't move the deal forward. Oh, but that's what they asked for. Well, We've found, we've took a look at it, and half the time companies ask you for your patent and your prototype when they initially show interest and they ask via email. And then our students, we always push our students to get on the phone and talk to them. That's a long conversation, what you say on that, that you know, a long discussion on what you do and don't say on that initial call. But when you get on and talk to them, they don't even bring it up. They just didn't know how to start the conversation. So sometimes the marketing manager, maybe he's been with the company a couple years. He's never licensed a product with an inventor. Maybe the company's done five deals, but he never has. He doesn't know what he's doing. And that's what shocks a lot of people. A lot of the marketing managers of these companies, they don't know how to move the licensing deal forward. But our students do because they help them. Our coach will help them move it forward by pushing them a little bit, guiding them. And an example of that is, they ask for the a prototype and the patent, and you just say, yeah, I got some things I want to talk about. You know, let's get on a call. And that's a litmus test to see if they're truly interested. Anybody can write an email. What does it take? Six seconds to say, send me your patent, send me your prototype. But if they are willing to spend 10 minutes to talk to you on the phone, that shows they're truly interested. So um, let's see. So yeah, if company asks you to sign a non-confidential, okay. That's another one. That was from Keaton. 
Um, if a company asks for a patent, if so, uh, what to do? So get on the phone with them and change the topic because it's not all about the patent. And I found that the marketing managers or whoever is getting obsessed about that. That's a bit of a red flag. You still deal with it and you still talk to them. But um, if they're overly concerned about the patent, don't even want to talk to you about the marketing or anything else, um, you know, until they see the details of the patent, that's kind of, it's kind of a red flag. I'm not saying that, oh, and then that, now you can't put a deal together because of it, but it sh it's, they're showing their true, true face. Other times it's just, they don't know what to say. Um, Jeff says, if a company asks, me to sign a non-confidentiality agreement. That's pretty common. Um, and the product idea gets out there, uh, out by doing, by their doing, does that constitute public disclosure? So, um, you know, if you, you always want to file a provisional patent before you start calling, but it does. Um, if a company uh, took the product, now why would they do this? And they pasted it up all over the internet. Now, why would they do that? You're privately showing them something. And they're saying, and then the agreement that they want you to sign is a non-confidential. Hey, whatever you share with me, you know, you know, is we can't agree to keep it confidential. Whatever protection you have is what you have. Whatever we share, you know, I realize you can't agree to keep it confidential. Maybe it's if it's a bilateral non non-confidentiality. You filed your provisional. Why do you care? But it would. But you're right. It would constitute public disclosure. But why would they make a public disclosure? Why would they do that? I've never ever, we have students all the time that will sign non-confidentiality agreements, be okay with having a provisional patent. And um, I've never ever in 20 years had a student, well, they put it out there into the public. Now I'm screwed. Never seen it happen. Could, but what's, so that's what I love talking about is like what could happen and what typically happens. Having done something for 20 years, with students in 65 countries, we know what is common and what's not more than I think anybody on the face of the planet from an independent inventor perspective. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, file your, make sure you file a provisional patent, Jeff, and that's fine for our students. Um, um, Micah says, can someone under 18 create an LLC? How would you go about doing that? Uh, why do we get so many questions about LLCs? Um, that's interesting. Every, every time we get a lot, I don't think you can, Micah. I have no idea. I think it's going to vary by state, but the question is, why do you need to? I always say when you're in the midst of doing a licensing deal, um, I think it's always, it's always a good idea to do it under an LLC or a corporation, not under your own name, but you don't have to do that until you get to the deal stage. And that's not legal advice. I'm just saying a lot of our students will do it at that point. Um, and if you're under 18, just then work something out with your parents or somebody else that you trust that's over 18. Um, but my understanding is that, you know, if you're under the 18 and most states in the U.S. are all states, is that you're not kind of held uh, accountable for the contracts that you sign. And so that creates a problem. So maybe, I don't know if, I think you, I think you actually might be able to hold them accountable, but they can't hold you accountable. I'm not really sure how that works. But I wouldn't worry about the LLC, man. Get a deal on the table. That's a good problem to have. Um, and, and seek, seek services from an attorney if you need to file an LLC. But if you just heard us talking about it, uh, you know, my guess is you don't need to be doing that right now if you're licensing, cause you're not selling anything. There's no income until you do a licensing deal. Right. Um, Jason said, I'm attaching just the sell sheet. Don't have a video when I submit to companies with a nice short, short message of introduction. That sounds good and nothing else, question mark. You're awesome, Andrew, thanks a bunch. So um, let's see if, is that based on an earlier question? No, well, Jason, so it sounds like you're just making a comment there. Yeah, I, I think that sounds great. Um, you're keeping it short in the email, you're not rambling. Yeah, you, you have a sell sheet or I'm assuming it's good, you think it's good um, and nothing else in the email, you're doing great. If you just want confirmation, you're doing the right thing there, you're doing great. and. Um, Thank you for saying that I'm awesome. Uh, let's see. Benjamin says, hi, I'm new to the licensing game. What will happen after you get interest? Will the company directly send you a contact? Question mark. No, Benjamin, when you, 
when you we teach our students to reach out to the key players at the company so you'll or, oh will the company send you a contract yeah but we teach our students to reach out to the key players in the company and no they're not going to go oh we're interested and they email you a contract back so on average from the time you get interest till the time the deal is signed we found that time on average to be three months it could be two weeks, more than likely with a DRTV company because they like to act really quick. Other companies don't do that. So, you know, it might be a phone call, then four or five emails, another phone call. Oh, we need to get some quotes in China. And then three weeks goes by. And right, okay, well, everything's looking good there. Oh, but we need to check with Sally. And a lot of it is you pushing it forward. So you need to know when to lie back. Go, okay, they need to do that. And I said that, and then other times you need to kind of nudge them and push them and ask them questions and get them engaged. And it's important to engage them and create that relationship early up front. So when you need to push them, they're, they're, they're used to engaging you in a conversation. Um, so no, they definitely don't send you a contract right away. And the average deal time is three months, the time from you get interest to a contract. And I like to delineate the two stages of a, uh, negotiation. As soon as you get interest, I think you're in negotiation. But initial interest to contract is way more important than contract to closed because they're evaluating the product. Just because they saw your sell sheet doesn't mean every, all, everything lines up, that it's cost effective to manufacture, that everybody in the company is on board, that, you know, that they have the bandwidth to do a new product right now. You know, there's a lot of things that need to line up. And a lot of it I, I would I would say that this is an exact statistic, this one, but that 80% of the deals our students get in, if we weren't guiding our student, our inventor, to move the deal forward, they would fizzle out. They just fizzle out unless you push it forward. Only the most interested company will be proactive in keeping it moving forward for you. They don't do that. You're like, oh, they're a big company, Andrew. They know what they want to do next. No. Um, they don't because they're still investigating. And so you're way more responsible for moving the deal forward than they are. Way more. That freaks people out when people know they have a coach to guide them along and freak them out so much. So if you've been getting a lot of interest and then things just fizzle out, now it, the deals fall off all the time. Not everybody that gets initial interest. I mean, some of our students call 30 companies, get interest from five and then four fall off and then they end up with you know one left. That's really common. You know, um, but they I see all the time, like the, the, the inventor like tells me, not our students, other inventors that I talk to about how it's been dragging. I talk to inventors I'm like, oh, I've been talking to this company a year. I'm like, what's going on there? And they're like they're like waiting stupidly. Um, that's not a good way to put it. But, you know, they're, they're waiting um, because they're green about how to do this for the company to take action. It's just not working. Um, but when you, but you're not being pushy. You're not being like obnoxious. You're not yelling at them. You're not being super pushy. It's all very friendly and you're kind of directly friendly guiding them, you know, where you, where you need them to go. And you're like, Oh, I can't do that. It's a big company, Andrew. Well, it's not the company you're doing that with. You're doing it with a person a real person, a marketing manager usually. So that's okay. There's people just like us. Um, it's a great question, Benjamin. Uh, Zam says, if I had a novelty product and I had multiple versions of the same item, for example, a drinking glass, but each in a different shape, would I present them separately? If you had multiple versions of the same item, uh, for instance, Kickerland or Fred and Friends or at the same time. I, I, you know, I mean, if let's say, so you're saying, for example, it's a glass and they're unique shapes. I'd say in that case, if you had some novelty glasses, they were out of funny things uh, or novel things that you could present multiple at the same time. Um, if it's so, if it's that specific. Um, now, if each one had its own unique vibe, you might want to, let's say it's a glass and it's um, it's a guy picking his nose or doing maybe it's gross stuff or doing something else, right? And and you, I could see that I mean, when you said novelty, I, that's why I thought that. But um, but Fred and Friends and Kirkerland wouldn't be interested in a glass, the guy picking his nose. But um, but if if the products kind of like kind of like they match up. 
But if each one's kind of very unique, I would present it in different cell sheets. Um, and I'm going to give the, the, the same advice that I always give to everybody. The way you, you get to know people and companies is by sending them your first product. You don't ever send 20 products or even three products up front. And you let them say no to it because most of the time they're going to say no. You only need one yes. And they say, oh, no problem. Are you open to more? Oh, yeah. Do you like to see a bunch at the same time or just one? What's your preference? So I just email you. And so you use that first one to get in. But um, so who was that from? That was from Zam. So I can't really say without looking at it, Zam, but most of the time it's going to be separate cell sheets. But if you have kind of a line and they're just different designs and the whole same theme, then that's fine. Um, uh, Emistine. Uh, Hi, Andrew. Can someone just sell ideas? Yes, you can just sell ideas, but you have to show them how they're going to sell it. You can't be the rambling inventor that thinks they're gonna like talk to somebody 10 minutes on the phone and ramble and explain your product. Who, who has time for that? Nobody does. And if you do that, you're giving all us other inventors a bad name. Um, so you have to always do a marketing piece. You know, you could have a virtual prototype, you could have a drawing, but it's gotta look decent. And so you're gonna show them how they're gonna sell it with a marketing piece. So can you just sell an idea? Yes, you can. And a lot of times, they're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't look hard to manufacture because we just do it like those other products. We just change that piece. And, you know, so you got to ask yourself, um, and you got to look at the products in the market in the space and go, does this product make sense? And if it does, you have to do a good marketing piece. You have to make your list of companies. You have to reach out to all of them. Um, so, you know, how people, how you define as what is just an idea, I don't know. I mean, but it is still an invention. Um, but if you don't take the time to show them how they're going to market it, they can see you haven't took the time. And now you're just a crazy inventor emailing random ideas. It's not an idea if you make a marketing piece. It's a product. You might not even have a real prototype. You just have a virtual prototype. But you have to illustrate it in a marketing piece. So, And that might just be an idea. But you're like, but you look at the other products and go, yeah, this could be made. you got to ask yourself that, you know, and a lot of other things we teach our students. So, <coughs> Ernestine, thank you for that. Uh, okay. John says, hi, Andrew. My question is, have you or Stephen ever been approached and participating in a partnership agreement with any inventor after seeing it, respecting the two of you having uh, great knowledge? Yeah, we get approached for that all the time over 20 years. We get approached for that constantly. And over 20 years, we never have and we never will because it's not our mission. Our mission is to help and assist inventors to be comfortable with, to, to do and say everything right on the project they work with us. Guide them through everything, including their licensing coach and negotiation coach. Guide them through the whole process. Um, and we're there for you at every turn. And through experiential learning, we want you to say then, I get it, guys. I can license stuff for the rest of my life. I got this real life experience. You can read a book, you can watch a video, you can watch these videos. You think you know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing until you do it. Um, and so our whole mission is to empower, empower being the word, inventors. So if we, if we first off, we have 23 people in the company. So if, if we started licensing products for inventors and not just coach people, I don't know, we need maybe 100. That's a whole other business model. And also it'd be weird, like, oh, well, you partnered with him, but not with me. Like you're just willing to coach me, but you're going to partner with him. And also so that that's not going to work. Another reason why it doesn't work is um, most inventors, when they want to partner, what they want to mean is like, I got a great idea. I want you to do all the work. You do everything. I don't want to do anything. And, you know, what's and that now then we're just becoming an invention promotion company. You know, so there's all these invention promotion companies. I have never met in 20 years I've been doing this a single inventor personally ever that had an invention promotion company license their product. These are these companies that advertise in TV and, and online and stuff. Never. But our students are licensing stuff all the time. You know why? Because our students actually do the freaking work. They actually get it out in front of companies. I really don't think these other companies are, are doing the work. They're saying, oh, you don't have to do anything, Mr. Inventor. Just give us 10 grand. 
pretend to work on it for a year. Oh, nobody was interested. How do you know they called anybody? You know, it's, it's, it's just, and, and I see inventors get taken every single day. We talk to somebody that's been taken to, for 10 to 12 grand by an invention promotion company. So, um, you know, so we don't want to, be in that same category with people that partner or do it all for you because we're all about empowering folks. And, uh, and we stick to that and we get offered that all the time. I've seen some amazing stuff we probably missed out on. Oh, but Andrew, you're missing out. It's like, no, we have, we have, we have a code of conduct. We have ethics that we've stuck to for 20 years. Our, our coaches never partner with people. Steve and I never partner with people, but we act as if we're your partner. We work that hard for our students and with our students. But if an inventor doesn't want to do any work, I don't want them as a student. I mean, that, why, I, why am I going to take their money to be a student of ours and guide them if they're not willing to do any work? So we do a lot of screening when people are, are interested in our program. We don't just let anybody sign up. We turn people away, believe it or not. People are shocked by that. Because if they're not, if they're like, we want to set expectations. Like this is, we're going to make you do all this work. Are you good with that? Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I want, Andrew. I want to work on products the rest of my life. And this project's really important to me. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, John, yes, we get approached to partner all the time. And <laughs> some people are obnoxious about it. They'll ask like eight or nine times. And I'm like, the answer is still the same. You know, they think they can just like convince us. Um, and I'm like, no, we can help you, you know, and our, what we, for what we do, I think it's very affordable for what we do. And we don't take any percentage whatsoever, um, when we work with people, uh, Alex, I think it's Alex. It, it's a handle AL three X. Um, if a company licenses my product idea, I'm in the middle of licensing agreement, Am I still able to file a PPA instead of filing a non-provisional? Yeah, of course. You can file a PPA anytime. You can do a licensing agreement and go, you know what? I got this new version for them. They're selling really well. I'm going to create this new version. But before I do, I'm going to file another PPA, and then I'm going to show it to them so they can keep their game up You know, with the product they've already licensed. So. Um, yeah, you, you, so you can, so basically, Alex, you can, you can file multiple PPAs. So how that works is there, a provisional patent is not a provisional patent. And attorneys love saying this, and they're right. It's a provisional patent application. It's not a patent. Now, if you file a full utility patent, you can reference the provisional and you get that filing date. So it's a provisional patent application. But what it does, is it lets you fish off the end of the pier for an entire year and say patent pending so you can see if anybody's interested. It's an incredible tool. And really you should be filing that provision like the day before you're ready to start calling. Like it's not the end of the world. If you file a provisional and you sit on your hands, you can always go back and file it again. You don't get the original date, you get the new date from the new provisional. But when people get the warm and fuzzies, they're protected filing a provisional. But if you're not ready to start calling, what's the freaking point? You know, you should be ready to start calling. You know, so it's an incredible tool. It's a very empowering tool, um, which Stephen and I love. But what's the point if you don't know how to reach out to companies? Um, so, Alex, yes, you absolutely can file uh, a provisional in the middle of a licensing agreement. Absolutely. Um, uh, let's see, Raul. What? Raul says, hey, Andrew, how long does it take a, oh, okay. How long does it take a company to usually get back to you about moving forward after taking interest? And they said it will be reviewed by the team. All over the map, Raul. Um, you know, sometimes it just drops off the face of the plant. You need to follow up. Sometimes they'll follow with you. Um, that's why you need to ask them. I, I wouldn't, it would be irresponsible of me to answer that question. So I'll answer it with the best answer is ask them. So when they say it's going to be reviewed by the team, say, well, how long should I expect? And inventors, need, you need to get more comfortable with asking companies these things. Oh, great. You're going to review it by the team. So when should I check back? When, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. You don't have to say that. But should I check back in a couple weeks or a month? Or is that tomorrow? You know, and you want to ask them. And I think uh, 
I, I joke sometimes or students will, will say something to me or a coach and they'll say, they'll give me this whole scenario. And what do you think they're thinking? And I'm like, I don't know what they're thinking. I can't read minds. Why don't you ask them? So <laughs> it's okay to ask these questions. Um, you want to ask the right questions and you want to ask them in the right way. We would always guide our students, but you know, sometimes people want to be in their own head and they're creating this reality with what the company's thinking and when they should really be engaging more. I guess that's the best way to put it. So don't be afraid to engage. Um, uh, James said, can you file a PPA if you have a previous one about to expire? Yes. And I save inventors $10,000 on that all the time because the some attorney says, oh, if you want to preserve your filing date, you're going to lose all your rights if you don't file a full utility. And I'm like, uh, yeah, you lose that date. But if you file a new provisional, you'll get a year from today. If you haven't made a public disclosure anywhere, you know, why would you go out and spend 10 grand? OK, could somebody come up, come up with it in that time? It's possible. Do I see it often? Like never. Um, it could happen. But um, so, James, you can absolutely file another PPA. It really screws a lot of people up. And I think a lot of patent attorneys don't like me because they like, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I've got to file this. Uh, I got to file a full patent in the next month and a half, my patent attorney says. And I'm like, uh, why? And they go into it. Well, I'm going to lose my rights. I'm like, no, you aren't. You're going to lose that date. But you could file that exact same thing if patent attorney already did it for you. If you did it on your own, file it from the day, providing you didn't make public disclosure. And most inventors haven't if they're looking to license it. They haven't put it up on a website or something. Uh, so I'm sure, James, that didn't just help you, probably a lot of people listening. Um, but again, filing the provisional over and over and over again and constantly getting a new date and not making an effort to reach out to companies, what's the point of that? That's just, that's, there's no point. Um, yeah, it's 70 bucks each time. It's not a lot of money, you know. So it, it gives you a feeling like you're getting started, but just the right order of things is, uh, file a provisional when you're ready to start making the calls. Um, uh, ricochet, ricochet. I have the cell sheet prototype and a short video. I have a list of companies to call. Great. Sounds like you've got things lined up. All I need now is a PPA. Is it okay that I wrote it myself and if I use invent right. I don't know what you mean by that. Is It's okay if you wrote it yourself. Um, I find that uh, inventors that use our smart IP software, we have some software you can buy for 99 bucks. It's also included with our bootcamp and it will help you write the provisional patent. You still have to pay the patent office fee, the $70 fee, of course. Um, so, you know, yes, it's totally okay. 100% okay, I feel. And we've been guiding our students to write their own provisionals forever. You don't write your own patent. That's nutty because that's way too hard. But you can write your own provisional. It can be done in common English. Um, so I think it's totally okay. I can't say if you did a good job or not, Ricochet. I mean, so, it, but, you know, they're not even going to see it. So if you got a lot of interest, you could, before you show it to them, because that's not the first thing or anything. Well, the first thing they're going to want to see is my provisional. It's like, that's the wrong mindset if they're going that direction. They might, but most of the time they don't. So you could get some interest, you could start moving it forward, do some things to think, do conversations to get things moving forward. And, and then you could file a PPA again if you have somebody take a look at it and you realize it's not good before you show it to them. So that's another option that you can go with. Um, but yeah, it's totally okay. Um, so yeah, we have, so we, we uh, so when, when our students do, uh, Ricochet, if, if you, what we've what we started doing is most of our students, they use the smart IP software and they're just fine with that. And we're just fine with that. When we look at them, they're, they're good. Um, but a percentage of our students get obsessed with um, that. It's, oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's good enough in it. And they just can't get past it. So we have one patent attorney that will review um uh, provisionals that that people have written with smart IP he charges. Um, it's not part of our boot camp or anything. So if you do write, because you're asking a question, can you get somebody to look it over? A lot of patent attorneys, they don't like looking at provisionals inventors have written. 
And they'll, even if you did a decent job, they'll beat you up to try to get a full utility out of you or rewrite the provisional or something like that. They're not all like that, but a lot of them are. Um, so you really want to find an attorney that's okay with reviewing something an inventor wrote when well, most of them aren't, but I know of one. So if you want to reach out to me, um, but he's just reviewing ones that were written with smart IP. So if you use smart IP or software, he will review it. And I think the price is pretty reasonable. That was just something new that we started doing, but I don't think most people need it. I think most people can use smart IP and write their own provisional and be just fine. Um, there's also some books out there that you can use. I don't find people do as good of a job with that. Um, but you can use some books as well. Uh, Oh, Dexter says, regarding the packaging idea, I don't live in the U.S., and in my country, there's no PPA, only non-provisional. So, uh, D Dexter, here's your misperception. You're not limited by a geography. Nobody is. You can file a U.S. provisional patent just like anybody else. So this is a common misperception amongst inventors. So file a U.S. provisional. It's the exact same freaking price. They're not going to charge you anything more because you don't live in the U.S. It makes no difference. And most of the products that people license are going to be quite often most common in the U.S., in Canada, and in Europe. And so if you don't want to limit yourself to your geography. So let's say you're in Australia. We have tons of students in Australia. You should never limit yourself to your own geography. You should go where companies are more open to licensing, which is Canada, U.S., and Europe. I'm not saying you can't license other countries, but don't think in any way, shape, or form that you're limited by your geography. So that is the answer to your question about there being no PPA in your country. Who said you need to file a PPA in your country? Maybe it doesn't matter in your country. Maybe it's, you're highly unlikely to license a product in your country because companies aren't open to receiving outside ideas which is true in some other countries. But in the U.S., Canada, and in most of Europe, they're, they're open. I would say U.S., Canada more open than Europe, but Europe's plenty open too. We have students do deals in Europe too. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Michael says, is it a good idea to try to become a product developer for a specific company? Is it hard? Is it worth it? I'd like to stick with one genre and one company, I have so many ideas. Yeah, I mean, I think you can get a job as, a, as an inventor in certain companies. Uh, I think it's a hard, uh, hard to find that. Um, I think sometimes by approaching companies and showing them your products, we've had our students get jobs that way. They've been impressed with what they've been showing, whether or not they even license to them. They're like, well, I'm impressed with these products you're coming up with. Can you work for us? And so that's a possibility. But realize there are people out there called industrial designers and they've gone to school for product design and they can make beautiful stuff. So if you're just like a creative person and you, you have no design skills, you have to ask yourself, does it make sense for an idea person to be in this company? Do they need a full time person to do that? Maybe a part time. But then you start to, you know, you're getting paid a salary instead of the royalties. Like they could sell 200,000 units and you just got this small salary and you're like, oh, crap, what did I do? You know, so you got to take a look at that. But, you know, you can definitely um, get a job as an inventor within companies. I wouldn't say it's easy. Um, and especially if you don't have any design skills, because there's now sometimes the industrial designers, they're big, beautiful products and stuff, but they're not as creative and not th thinking outside of the box as an inventor that's maybe outside of the industry or in the industry. They just get used to doing the same thing and they've lost their creativity. That's why companies need you guys desperately. You know, they really, really need you. But to get a job in there, um, yeah, it's going to be harder to work out. You know, maybe a part-time job or something like that. Could be a full-time job. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have a lot of ideas you wrote. Uh, but then, you know, they're an industrial designer, whoever needs to make it happen. You know, and so are you going to be kept busy? Um, so you got to ask yourself that question. Michael says, I have a company who has a submission page and they say they are open to outside submissions, but they want you to have protection. Well, that's fine. Um, what does that mean by protection? If, if it's a provisional patent, no problem. That costs you 70 bucks. If a company says you have to have an issued patent, they're not interested in ideas. They're a dinosaur. 
any company that says you have an issued patent. And here's, here's the sad thing about it is some inventors then draw the false conclusion. It is truly a false conclusion. Well, then I should go spend 10000 on a patent. And the answer is no, because the companies that insist you had an issued patent are highly unlikely, highly unlikely, even if you have an issued patent, a license. Think about it. You're going to come up with an idea and you're going to sit around for two to three years to wait for your patent issue. And then you're going to show them your product on, an, on the issued patent thing. It's ridiculous. That company's archaic. They're not, they're not wanting to be on top of it. They're, they're kind of saying we're not interested in a way. Now, if they just say you want to have protection, that's fine, you know, because you can file a provisional for 70 bucks. And sometimes, so when they're not clear on it, I just I follow your provisional, I go ahead and submit. But if they say issued patent, but if they just say they want you to have protection, you're fine, you know. And the, the whole paper trail you create with them is protection too, right? Isn't that great? You know, people worry about that. You're creating this paper trail. Keep all those emails. Keep everything you sent. These companies are more afraid of you saying you, they, that, that they stole your idea than you should be of them. Uh, you know, so uh, William says, where do I buy a provisional patent application? So, William, you have two options. You can go to a patent attorney and a patent attorney can write a provisional patent for you. Or you can use like software on our website and it will save you a huge amount of money. Use our smart IP software and you can write it yourself. So you have those two options. You can, there's also books on how to write your provisional patent. I find inventors don't do as good a job with those, but that's another option as well. And then you can file it yourself with the patent office for 70 bucks. But I would say if you have an attorney do it, it's going to cost you uh, 600 to 2,500. Sometimes the inventors, uh, patent attorneys will do is they'll say, oh, we're going to write this because you don't have to write a provisional like a full utility patent. We're going to write it like a full utility. So I'll charge you $6,000 and they will only charge you $2,000 when you need to upgrade it to a full utility, you know, before the end of the year. Th knowing they're just trying to kind of get more money out of you, I don't find that to be a smart play mo the, like 98% of the time. Um, but a uh, 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 patent attorney or agent will typically charge about 600 to 2,500 to file a provisional. On your own, your cost of the patent office is 70 bucks. So I, Stephen and I, and um, at InventRight, we, we highly recommend people do that. Again, I didn't do a disclaimer today, so none of what I say is legal advice. Seek the service of an attorney if you need legal advice, but that's the approach that our students use. So, and where did that go? Uh, William, and it, it sounds like you're very new. Um, just the way you wrote it, like where do I buy a provisional patent application, which is fine. So watch us ramble on YouTube. I think we got 500 plus shows. Maybe buy our book, One Simple Idea. Get more familiar with licensing, and that should help you out tremendously. Be patient with yourself, and and don't go throwing money at a company that says they're going to sell your idea for you. Um, I either you do this yourself and you approach companies, um, and they're going to take it from there. It's their money and their workforce and their distribution. But you have to do the work to sell it to that one company. You can do it and don't get victimized by an invention promotion company, you know, saying, we'll do it all for you. And you're like, oh, great. Here's $12,000. You know, it's like. Um, oh. OK, sorry. My, Michael had a second question below that, which I didn't see. And he expanded on it on his page where they talk about you need protection. He says their their options are one patent granted, patent filed, or no patent. So does a provisional patent applicant qualify as patent filed, or does that apply only to non-provisional? Guys, this isn't like you're not under oath here. All right, you're submitting a product to a company. So I would just make the assumption that patent filed means. Uh, patent pending. So you can just write, because you, legally you can say it's patent pending status, patent filed. I would just, just choose patent filed because you filed a provisional patent application. So um, sorry, I didn't see that earlier there, Michael. But my rambling helped everybody else to expand on that topic. So it was all good. Um, Alex says, can you make a video of, of doing a patent search and modifying your idea by making it different from the patented one. Um, 
Well, that's not what you're really looking to do, Alex. You're always looking to create the best product possible. So I think what you're saying is if, if you come across one that's an issue, how do you get around it? Um, so, you know, we have, we, we just created a whole new series for our students on patent searching. It's amazing with this professional patent searcher. So we train our students to do patent searching. Um, that is very in depth. That could never be done in a 10 minute YouTube video. Um, but you know, a lot, the vast majority of time when there are patents out there that you can get around them and people are like, Oh, but then people can get around mine too. No, you want to think about the variations and the workarounds. You want to put your feet up on the desk and go, well, this is what mine is. But what are the other ways that it could be done? And most inventors are very creative. But once you've been deciding in your mind, this is what it is, this is what it is, this is what it is. And then you, when it comes time to file the provisional, 80% of filing a good provisional is thinking about, well, how else could this be done? And throwing those variations in the provisional patent application. So, Alex, that's what you really want to do. You want to throw all those variations in your provisional patent application and think about it. Don't throw variations that are 50% as good. That's just a waste of your time. But if it's a version that's 70% as good or just as good, but not the version you're pitching or 90% as good, throw all that crap into your provisional patent. Yeah, I said crap. I'm going to get your attention because we're at the end of the hour. See if you guys are still awake. Um, so <laughs> throw all that in there. And that's not a patent attorney's job. That's your job. So even if you're getting most, most, a lot of patents and provisionals are absolute garbage, garbage, because the inventor didn't do that. Now, that's the inventor's fault. But when you pay a patent attorney eight, ten thousand dollars to get a patent, don't you think it's their duty to come back to you as the inventor and go, hey, if you want me to do a good job, give me the variations, give me the workarounds. No, what a lot of them do, they take whatever garbage you gave them, and that's the inventor's fault, and they just file a patent on it, and now this patent's garbage. And that's why they say huge, huge numbers of patents are weak to garbage. Now, you guys won't do that, just with that little tip I gave you. A good patent attorney will make you do that. But a bad patent attorney is like, and the inventor is like, well, that's your job. You know, you know, if you're stupid, if you say that to a patent attorney, because a good patent attorney will push you. What are those things? They're not the inventor. You are. What makes you think that that's their job? It's not. Their verbiage and all that, that's their job. So, um, but just that one tip alone, that's huge. That was worth it right there. Um, when you're filing provisionals, everybody's worried, oh, did I do a good job? Well, did you think about the variations? If you did, you probably did a decent job. Um, and then our software helps you take it up a notch as far as the formatting and all that sort of thing. But it's not hard to file a provisional, guys. Okay. It's funny. We get some of these same questions every – but then we get some new great ones too. Um, Nicholas says, I have a PPA prototype and a sell sheet and a list of 30 companies. How do I get the help I need from where I am to secure a license? Well, I mean, I'm biased, but you can sign up for our coaching program. You go to the Invent Right, click on coaching, and we can guide you through all that. You know, sometimes people, they, they feel like they're really far along, but, you know, a big part of it is reaching out to the companies and that back and forth and being very persistent and then discussing with the companies. So Nicholas, what I would say is that I think that's what we do. Um, and one thing I think people don't understand sometimes is the way we handle our coaching is we instantly jump to wherever you're at. Some people literally just have a thought in their head and we'll start there. Some other people, they've been venturing their product and selling it. They're making millions of dollars a year, but they're like, oh, Andrew, I'm dying here. I know a bigger company can do so much better than I could. And then everybody in between, you know. And so what we can do is jump to where you are and people are like, oh, but I've done all this stuff. So I'm not getting this value. No, you're getting more value because we're dealing with more higher level stuff. That's, all, that's my response to that. So, Alex, I'm, I'm biased, but I, I think we could definitely help you. Um, was that Alex? Uh, Nicholas, sorry. Not Alex. I think it was close. Um, no, it's not close. Uh, da, da, da. okay. Okay. 
Vet, vet says I have a, this is also confusing to me. I have an invention and a prototype of it. I absolutely have no idea what to do next. Can you please tell me the next steps? Uh, vet, I would say that um, buy our book, One Simple Idea. It's the yellow book. Buy our book, One Simple Idea. Go to InventRight Resources. Buy our book, One Simple Idea. That will help you tremendously get your bearings with the 10 steps. You can watch the YouTube show, but it's not like neatly laid out in the 10 steps. It's all different topics. So I would watch our YouTube show and our get our book. It's like 13 bucks. I think Steve and I make like five cents each or something like that on that when we sell those. So um, buy One Simple Idea and watch the YouTube show and invest in your education and just have fun and go, oh, I'm starting to get an idea. Um, the people that want to spontaneously go from idea to products sold, they end up getting victimized by invention promotion companies and say, oh, we'll do it all for you. And then you got nothing to show for it at the end of the year except for an empty wallet. Um, so you got to invest in your education. That's totally OK that you're confused. But I think we, we, we do a good job of making it clearer than anybody else. And, you know, this Q&A is just a bunch of random questions. So I could see that being a little confusing but if you come back to one of these after you got a little bit more you're like oh, okay i'm understanding what the hell he's talking about now um to, to michael says hi andrew i have one idea concept that is filed under utility patent but multiple designs for that one concept would i have to file multiple utility patents for each new product no you can almost always put it under the same utility patent. Um, you know, it really depends, but you could probably put it under the same utility patent. I definitely wouldn't hesitate to put it under a provisional if we have one idea concept. So you've already filed one. You know, if you've already filed it, you're probably going to have to do the PPAs on those product variations. But yeah, but if it's just so completely disconnected, no, but if it really makes sense, um, you, it's a big part of what a patent is, covering different variations. It's a big part of what it is. Um, okay, uh, Trevin, I'm new to your group and inventing, but isn't it better to get my product to the market by creating and running my business, proving sales numbers and valuation before I look at doing licensing? God, no. <laughs> It's painful. Um, I can't think of a, uh, I was going to try to come up with something that was similar. Um, no, and it's not necessary. It's your misbelief that you think you need to sell the product to prove it before a company would be interested in licensing it. But that's not true. You do a good marketing piece. They see it. They use their gut instinct. They know the space and they license it, now they take all the risks. It was incredibly time consuming, Trevin, for you to do what you wanna to do, to start a business, to then sell it. You know, usually you need hundreds of thousands of dollars just to barely get started. So, um, you know, at, like, so our other co-founder, Steven, he's done nothing but licenses products for his whole career. But about six years ago, he started these little guitar picks and they were a shape of Mickey Mouse and skulls and things. And they sold more at 7-Elevens than they did in music stores. They were kind of a novelty. They were in a different shape, like picture a guitar pick in the shape of a skull. Um, and they sold incredible. And he was able to make those for less than six cents a piece. They sold in a three-pack for, for, I think, $2.99. So on a six-cent product, they started that business with $200,000, and they ran very quickly out of money on a six-cent product because they started getting some big orders. So, and then, so Trevin, you selling your product on some small scale to a big company that almost looks bad in some ways. It's like, oh, you're selling a hundred units a month. Oh, it's, it's, that's unimpressive. It can actually hurt you. Um, so I always tell people if they've been venturing, say, oh, I was just testing it, you know, this or that. You got to make some excuses there because that's ridiculous to them. Whereas if they just see your sell sheet, the sky's the limit. So to start a new business, to prove it out, and then, then license it, it is, I'm just going to say, it's pretty stupid um, because it's incredibly huge amount of work. It's crazy work. And you need to do so many things to run a business and manufacture and sell a product yourself. And in most cases, unless it's on some really little micro level, it's at least hundreds of thousands just to get started. So God, that would complicate our process incredibly. And what if it doesn't work out? 
Now you can't move on to your next product. So it's absolutely positively not required, Trevin. Have I had students that have done it, that were struggling, and then they decided to license it? Yes. Have I had students that were moderately or very successful, and then they said, yes. But, that was, but usually what they say to me is, I didn't realize I had this licensing path. If I'd known, I wouldn't have done all this because I'm it was so painful, Andrew. That's what they usually say. So could you take that path if you really want to start your own business, sell it yourself, and then later license it? Yes, you could, but don't think that it's required in order to license it. Please don't do that. Um, I think we're about 10 minutes over here, guys. Um, Vet says she's definitely going to buy the book. Yeah, Vet, I think it's going to help you out a lot. Um, Uh, Joanne says, I have a deal for a mask. Should I file a PPA since we won't be using masks forever? At least I hope not. Uh, yeah, you should file a PPA. Definitely, Joanne. Uh, and we might be wearing masks for a couple years. Hopefully not, but we may. And there's still going to be people concerned. There's still going to be a market for masks. And there's going to be, hate to say it, but maybe other things that come up. God forbid. We're all just hoping that things get better, right? Um, John says, uh, I took a company's product and completely modified it into a game. I created a prototype as well as a video. I want to contact them, but fear they're having, they have fear they having the tooling to take the idea. Um, so, well, you shouldn't, in my opinion, you shouldn't bother creating a product for one company. You do all this work, you show it to one company, they're not interested. You should say, well, I want to create it for this company. And if they're not interested, oh, well, I have 10 other companies or 20 other companies that I can pitch it to as well. So that would be my question for you, John. It's a waste of time to create a product specifically for one company. I have students that will do it occasionally, but, but think about it. You do all that work and instead of having 20 chances for success, you have one. It doesn't really make sense. But if you're like, oh, it'd be perfect for them the way I changed it. But all these other companies could do it too. So if they're not interested, I'm going to show it to others. That's just being practical. Um, people get wrapped up in, in, their, in their own ideas. Um, yeah, Michael, I, I can't comment on other companies. I, I never talk about other companies um, specifically. Uh, so I can't, I can't comment on that. I'm tempted sometimes, but I, but I don't. I, I keep that as a hard and fast rule. So, um, so I want to remind everybody to take care and keep inventing and I'll be back here next Monday. If you want to come on back, it's been fun. Sorry about the, uh, audio problem with my new fancy mic here. It wasn't with the mic. It was that it wasn't it said it was recognized. And then when I went live, it didn't work. So I'll see if I can test that. Cause I, I like not having to wear this stupid headset, but whatever gets you guys good audio. And I want to remind everybody that, you know, when you're inventing, yeah, for most of you, it just started happening one day. It's part of who you are. So if you're ready to go beyond ideas and to actually reach out to companies, uh, we're your guys, whether that's watching our YouTube show or reading our books or signing up for a coaching program, but we are here for you. And you have to make that jump from dreaming up ideas to actually working on them. It's a hard jump for a lot of people to make, but we can be here for you on that. And if it's part of who you are, it's never going to go away. It's going to be a thorn in your side if you don't take care of it. So take care of it, tackle it, enjoy it, do it, and you can do it. All right. See you guys. Bye.